Hi folks, so in this video what we're going to do is we're going to complete questions from the 2011 Leaving Cert TCG higher level paper. This is the section A portion of the paper where as always you're going to have four questions, A1, A2, A3 and A4 and you have to complete three questions to get the full marks. Okay, so they do give you obviously a little bit of options here and you can obviously choose your best three. Now in these videos as always what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with A1 then going on to A2, A3 and A4. So skip on to the parts that are relevant for you if you get started on any of these questions so i'll zoom in here on a1 now so just adjusting the camera there right so here is question a1 it says uh the treaty graphic below shows a molecule of methane we can see the molecule here the four outer atoms uh shown in red which are these guys here are located at the vertices of a tetrahedron and then it says the drawing on the right shows the projections of a regular tetrahedron without the sphere. So you've kind of got um, four points. Obviously, a tetrahedron is made up of, uh, it's a regular tetrahedron. So four equilateral triangles, okay, are making up this object. Uh, so you've got the apex A and then you have the points on the ground B, C and D. Okay, uh, part A, draw an auxiliary plan on the given X1, Y1 uh, to show the dihedral angle between the planes A, B, C and A, B, D. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Um, first of all, when you're getting the dihedral angle between any two surfaces, and the, if you look down here at the plan view, there's ABC and ABD. So they're basically saying, what is the angle in there, in there, uh, between those two surfaces? Now, the only way we can do that is we, first of all, when we're finding the dihedral angle, we have to find the line of intersection. If you look at the letters ABC and ABD, the line of intersection is the line between those two surfaces. In this case, it has to be AB, and you can see AB is in both of them. So, step number one, identify the line of intersection. We've done that. That is the line AB and AB in elevation. Step number two, we need to see that line as a true length. Now, in this case, the line AB is already a true length. It is a true length in our elevation view, okay, which is this guy up here. Okay, that line AB is a true length in elevation. Why is it true length? Because the line AB in plan is parallel with the principal planes of reference, okay, uh, the XY line in this case representing the wall in the plan view. Okay, because AB is parallel with the XY line of plan, it is therefore a true length in elevation. Therefore, when I look along that true length, I will then see it as a point view. But more importantly, I'll see the two surfaces that it's actually connected to, ABC and ABD, as edge views, giving me the line, or sorry, the dihedral angle between them. So, projecting out AB, we'll project it out. Because I'm projecting it out, uh, the X1, Y1 is already perpendicular to it, and I'm also going to project out C and D. Now, rule of thumb here, project from the elevation, take your depths from the plan. In this case, I'm just going to project out, sorry, the depths from the plan. So I'm going to mark down the distance from B to A, or B to B. Just do a line down like that. And I've got another one here. Okay. So, using my compass here, I'll switch out the head knot. So, I'm taking the distances, projecting the elevation, take the distances down, XY line down. So, I'll take the distance from the XY line down as far as B. And what you'll see there is that distance is the same as the distance from XY line down to A. I'm going to mark it out then from where AB projects out. You can see that point right there. That point there is now A1, comma, B1. I'm seeing the line of intersection, uh, the true length line, as a point view. Now I'm going to take the distance from the XY line down to C. That distance there. Mark it from the X1, Y1. And I'm now going to take the distance from the XY line down as far as D. That's quite small here, so I'll do it as best and accurately as I can. There we go. I'm going to mark it out. A bit awkward when it's so small. And there we have it. That point right there is now D1. And I've got C1. Okay. And what's helpful about that then is when I connect them up, I'm seeing the dihedral angle between those two faces. Maybe that. And maybe that. Okay. So there we have it, folks. Inside there is our dihedral angle. I'm just gonna put a little arrow in here. Inside there is our 
dihedral angle. Okay, and if you want then, you can come along with your protractor. I'm just going to extend the line a little bit so I have just lightly down here as well. Just to be able to measure it. So I put my protractor on it. Measuring that angle, and there to me it's saying 70 degrees. So there we go. 70 degrees. Now, just for demonstration purposes on the video, obviously you'd be using pencils on today. Heavy in those two lines. There's our edge views of those surfaces. Um, as always, guys, skip ahead to the questions that are relevant to you that you get stuck on on these videos. So part number one, done. ABC and ABD, we've got the dihedral angle. Part number two, draw the projections of the largest possible sphere that can be contained inside the tetrahedron. Okay, so the largest possible sphere that can be contained inside the tetrahedron. Now, what we have to do there is, first of all, identify where, I suppose, a center line could be. And an easy center line to do straight away is from the apex A, directly below that, in elevation, somewhere along that line there, has to be at the center point of our sphere. Why? Well, if we come down here to the plan view, it's a regular tetrahedron with the base sitting on the ground. Therefore, the edges uh, B, C, D, they're all true lengths. B to C is a true length, C to D, D back to B. Because we're looking down directly on top of it and we're seeing an equilateral triangle off of for the base. And all these lines end from B to A, D to A, and C to A are technically bisecting those 60 degree angles. Therefore, that's the center point um, of our triangle, BCD in plan view. And because that's the apex, therefore, that center point, when we look down on top of it, in elevation, somewhere along there has to be the center. Okay, the next thing then we need to see is we need to see a surface as an edge view. So we've got the surface ACD in plan. And we've got the surface ACD in elevation. And you can see here in elevation, it's an edge view. Why is it an edge view? Well, CD in plan is a true length. And technically, when we're looking straight at it, we're seeing point CD then in elevation as a point view, but the face then as an edge view. So if I bisect the angle between the XY line and this edge view of the face here, ACD, somewhere along that bisector should be the center point of my um, sphere. So if I bisect the angle inside there, Okay, and I'll bisect that angle inside there. And connect that back to the corner. And you can see where it goes through this point right here. That point right there should be the center point of our sphere. So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch out the head and the compass just so I can put it in nice and heavy for demonstration purposes. And the radius then, the radius for our sphere, should be the distance from the center point down to any edge. So I can literally take the distance from there down to the base. And before I draw it in, it should also be touching this line. I just want to make sure that it doesn't overlap. Yeah, quite happy with that. Just drawing it in. So that's my sphere in elevation and in plan view i'll draw it in as well just take my time with this now it's a bit awkward when we're using markers and there is the plan view of the sphere contained inside that tetrahedron Okay, now if I wanted to find the points of contact, well, technically, one point of contact would be right here. Okay, and the other one would be perpendicular to the face ACD. Now, there would be technically four points, but just showing you two of them. If I went perpendicular like that there, and you'd also have one over here. Okay, but there we have it, folks. Um, that there is the part B of the question, so part A done and part B done. Draw the projections of the largest possible sphere that can be contained inside of the tetrahedron. So there we have it, folks. That is A1 done. I'm going to move down here now to A2. So question A2, it says, 
A biomedical device, as shown in the graphic below, generates sound waves at one focus of an ellipse. Okay, the waves are then reflected to the other focus to shatter a patient's kidney stones. Okay, so you can see here we kind of got the graphic here, but then we've got the pictorial view over here. They're showing us kind of the medical device. The drawing on the right shows the directrix DD1, which is this line, the focus F, vertex, there's a vertex over here, and eccentricity line E of an ellipse. That is our line of eccentricity. Part A, locate the second vertex and second focus and draw the top half of the curve. Okay, so how do we find uh, the second vertex? Well, from the focus, all we're going to do is we're going to go 45 degrees to the axis line where it hits the line of eccentricity. I'm going to drop it back down perpendicular to my axis. And technically, that point right there will be my second vertex. And I'm going to call that v and i'm actually relabel this one as v1 okay so i found my second vertex now it asks us also to find um our second focus so to find the second focus really easy to do all i'm going to do is i'm going to take the distance from v to f which is that distance there on my compass and i'm going to come over to v1 and mark that distance in as well and there we have it that there now would be f1 so VF, F1, V, V1. All right. So there we have it, folks. Um, I've done the little first part. Now it's asking us to draw the top half of the curve. So what we're going to do is, from the focus, we're going to do a line going vertically up. That line is a line that's called the lattice rectum. Okay. I'm going to write it in here like this. Now... To get the portion of the curve, the top half of the curve of the ellipse, what we're going to do is we're going to do vertical ordinates, okay, to cut our line of eccentricity. So from the axis, I'm going to do a line vertically up to hit my line of eccentricity. That'll give me one inside here. I'm going to do a series of other ones. So from the axis, all the way up, I'm going to do, the more I do, the more accurate I'll be. Now you can space them out equally or you can take them at random. I'm kind of taking these at random either here. And I'm going to do another one about here. And where every one of those ordinate uh, lines hits our line of eccentricity, I'm going to project them across to hit my lattice rectum. So that is one there. Now this one went to the right because it's to the left of my uh, uh, la sorry lattice rectum. Now I'm going to project these ones here all to the left like that. I should have one more right at the tip top here. Okay, and all we're going to do now is we're going to find a series of points on our elliptical curve. So from the focus, I'm going to project, I'm going to mark up as far as where all those heights, those ordinate lines came across to the lattice rectum, project across like this. So that'll give me a point there. From this one here, that's going to be in relation to this ordinate inside here. Next one. I continue with that sequence. Now you don't have to do the curve the whole way in like I'm doing it here. It's just for demonstration purposes with the video. Then finally this one. Now, for every one of those projected across should give us a point on the top portion of our curve. Uh, so that is a point there, the vertex is a point, here's one. Uh, where the focus line actually cuts through the line of eccentricity also gives us a point. And then I've got a point here, a point here, here. And you can see all those points. Then V1 is also a point. Now that I've got a series of points on my elliptical curve, I can sketch it in. So just take your time with the sketching. V to the point, and we continue in that sequence. Okay, now that I've got that, all I'm going to do now. With my marker, take my time. 
I'll send you Dave an exam if you're using a pencil. So just having that in, trying to make it. Okay, and move around the page as you need to. Okay, so there you have it. There is the top portion of our elliptical curve. First part of the question completed. Now it says, part B, draw a tangent at a point on the curve, which is 70 millimeters from F. So all we're going to do here, when we get our tangents, there's two, two methods you could use here. I'm going to get 70 millimeters. So I'm going to get my T-square. I'm going to mark 70 millimeters on that. Okay, so what it tells us, draw a tangent at a point on the curve which is 70 millimeters from F. So from F, make sure I have 70 there, there you go. So from F, I'm going to mark, and you can see the arc I've just done there. That arc is giving me a point there. I'm going to call that point P. Okay, now I want a tangent line to go through that point. So in senior cycle DCG, the method that is often used is from the focus to the point P, I'm going to do a line like this. Okay, but that line that I've just done, the method is, if I go perpendicular to that line, just going to get my other set square here, if I go perpendicular to that line, I actually want to put this in, in green now, so that line there that I've just done, put it in green. Now what I want to do is, if I go perpendicular to that line, true F, I actually have to move my set square here down a little bit. It's so perpendicular to the line FP, but true F. You can see that line that I've just done there. And the relationship between those two lines is that they're perpendicular to one another. But more importantly, where that line cuts the directrix is technically point on my tangent line, that point up there. So now that I have that point on my tangent and I know it goes through P, well all I have to do then is draw in my tangent. You can see it there. And there is our tangent. Okay, I'm going to write that in. And there we have it. So that there is our tangent line. Now a method that you would have learned in the junior search is whereby you use the two focuses. You could connect F to P and extend it on. So I'll just extend it on lightly here. Like that. And you could also extend F1 through P and extend it on. And then you can bisect an angle. So you can see the angle created in here between F1, P and FP. If I bisected this angle here, from this line to this line, and I bisected that, well, that bisector should technically give me my tangent line as well. Okay, so either method would work there. Okay, but I said I put in just for demonstration purposes in the video method you would learn in senior cycle DCG. So there we have it, folks. That there is the second question done. Um, we've got the tangent and we drew the top portion of our ellipse. Okay, now we're going to move on to A3 at the top right of the page. So just move in here. So you can see here, A3 says the graphic below shows a number of sloping arms which support. Uh, light in a modern sculpture. So you can see it in the little pictorial here. And then it says, two such, are, two such arms are represented by the skew lines A, B, and C, D on the right. So we've got the elevation of A, B, and C, D, and we've got the plan view of A, B, and C, D. It then says, determine the projections of the shortest horizontal distance. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight that there. Now, that is kind of the influence of this question between the two lines. So the shortest horizontal distance between the two lines. So um, in these questions, in two lines questions, they'll either ask for the shortest distance between the two lines or the shortest horizontal distance. And that does have an influence in kind of what you do. So in this case, they ask us for the shortest horizontal distance. Step number one, we need to make a plane out of these uh, lines here, okay? So the way I'm going to do that is, I'm going to go parallel to the line CD, Move some equipment here. So parallel to the line CD from point B. So I'm going to use CD as the line I want to go parallel to. So parallel to CD 
can see I'm setting my set to square up on the line CD there. Hit a slide and set squares now. So let's actually move it down a little bit. Sorry. So parallel to the line CD, I'm going to go from B. So what's the relationship between the line there I just did? It is parallel to the line CD. Now from A, I'm going to do a horizontal line. Where the two lines cross each other, right there, I'm going to call that point P once again. Okay. Now that I've found P in elevation, I need to find it in the plan. So on the plan, naturally, it has to be somewhere directly below it in elevation. So somewhere down along that line is going to be point P in plan. How do I find it? Same principle I applied up here, I'm going to apply that now in the plan view. I went parallel to the line CD from B. So I need to find the line CD in the plan view. So I'll put it on the line CD there. And once again, Sliding set squares from B parallel to the line CD. And you can see there the line that I've just done. I have now found point P in my plan view. And we know P connects to A. I'll connect that up. And what's important about that line is that line there from P to A is a true length in my plan view. Why is it a true length? Because in elevation, the line is parallel with the XY line. Therefore, it's a true length in our plan view. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look along that true length, and I will actually see the surface ABP as an edge view. But more importantly, I'll actually see kind of the two lines then, AB and CD, uh, being parallel to one another. Okay, and that's going to kind of help us along our way to finding the shortest horizontal distance. So I'm going to set up an X1, Y1 now, and that one, X1, Y1, is going to be perpendicular to the line AP. I'll come back and I'll heavy in all this stuff in a while. But that line there, or X1, Y1, and I'm going to project out all my points. So B goes out, A, C, and D. Okay, so I projected out all my points. So if you project from the plan, you take your heights from the elevation. So just T square back here. I like to do this. I'm just going to put in the vertical heights like this. Just makes my life, I feel, a little bit easier. And then C and D are actually quite small now. C and D, I should say. So. Project from the plan, you're going to take your heights from the elevation. So the height for A, starting off, I'm going to mark the distance up to the A there. And I'm going to mark it out from A on the X1, Y1. Next one, I'm going to take is D. I'm going to mark it out from D. Okay, and then the next one is C and B. Now, based on the attachment I'm using on my compass here, it's a little bit small to take, so you can just come along and measure it. So I'm going to mark from the 10 there, and you can see I'll put the 10 on the XY line. And there it's telling me that C is up 4 millimeters, 1, 2, 3, 4. And I'll come over and I'm going to check B now. That looks the exact same. So they're both up about 4 millimeters. So the easiest thing for me to do is just mark out 4 millimeters from both C and B. So from B... From the X1, Y1, I'm going to mark out 4. And do the exact same from C. And I'll mark out 4 as well. Now, now that I've found all those points, I'm going to label them. So I've got D1, I've got A1, B1, and C1. Now, what you should find here is that the line A1, B1 and the line C1, D1 should be parallel. Now, I'll always line them up first before I draw them in, and I check that they're lining up parallel. Because if they're not, or if they're not even close, then I've done something wrong. Let's check here. Yep, I'm quite happy with that. So look, C1 to D1, I'll heavy that line in. And now from B1 to A1, and there's my lines. 
okay that there is the auxiliary elevation of those lines and now what i need to do is uh this is the important part okay so i'm going to set up an x2 y2 okay but more importantly that x2 y2 is going to be perpendicular to my x1 y1 that will give me the shortest horizontal distance if they only ask me for the shortest distance i would then set up my x2 y2 parallel with the lines okay and project up this way so there is a slight difference so to get the shortest horizontal distance i need to set up my x2 y2 perpendicular to my x1 y1 so all you can see here all i'm going to do is like that so i'm just going to bring it in here actually put it a little bit inside it that there is my x2 y2 i'm going to project out all my points then so b and c they're the same height they'll actually go along the same line then i've got d and i've got a okay and rule of thumb here now is you take your distances for the x2 y2 from the previous x y line back in this case it's the x1 y1 okay so this is actually coming into an auxiliary plan so i'm going to take the distance now for d let's work my way along there's d mark it out from d1 same with c Mark it out from C1. Same with A. Mark it out from A1 on the X1, Y1. It's just kind of going all right onto the border there. You can see it. Okay. And finally, B. And mark it out from B1. And once again, labeling these, so this will be C2, B2, I have A2 up here, and I finally got D2 here. Okay, once again, connecting those lines together. So connect A to B, A2 to B2 I should be saying. And connect D2 and C2 together like that and technically for those lines intersect one another should give me a point that is called the shortest horizontal distance between those um, two uh, lines okay so just that point right in there I'm just going to write s dot h dot d put a little arrow into it so that there is my shortest horizontal distance now what I have to do is I have to work that backwards through the views until i get to the elevation because in the elevation we will see that then as a um as a horizontal line okay so these are my projection lines just to guide me here so up there when i work it back that's going to be my line that is my auxiliary elevation but more importantly that now is going to give me a point there on the line cd so i need to find that in my plan that's going to be right there in my plan and millimeters do matter here now there is my line in my plan view now this is what i don't like about the setup of these questions sometimes because our lines are so thick there could be a bit of discrepancy about where i draw it from let me make a little mark so i can see it that's my line in the plan view and now i have to project it up to my elevation this should be a horizontal line I'll mark it up there yeah and it's looking close enough i'm quite happy with that now what i often do here is once i bring up one point you can see the point i'm after bringing up it's on the line a b from that then i often like to do this i just do a horizontal line because that's how it should appear and technically that point right there should line up with the point down here we'll see what our accuracy is like um, about yeah that actually worked out for once pretty perfect and there we go okay now i'm just going to put that line in my marker here 
So that is the elevation of the shortest horizontal distance. That there is the plan. And here is the auxiliary elevation of that line. Okay, so right there I have the shortest horizontal distance. Okay, and just really quickly now, just to make it stand out a little bit clearer, I'm going to go over my lines. That there was my x1, y1. This here was my x2, y2. Once again, just labeling over those. X1, Y1, now drawing or heaving in projections. So there is the auxiliary elevation, and technically, this one here would be an auxiliary plan. There we go. So there you have it, folks. That there is question A3 done, uh, whereby we determine the shortest horizontal distance uh, between the lines A, B, and C, D. And, uh, a nice skew lines question that they often like to throw at, at a higher level exam. So there we have it, guys, A3 done. Now we're going to move on to A4 at the bottom of the page. So it says here, um, the graphic below shows a figure and a sorry uh, sorry the graphic below shows a figure and a ball from a table tennis or table soccer game okay it's like sabutio okay a uh, really old kind of style and kind of table soccer game it says here the drawing on the right which represents the objects shows the elevation and incomplete plan of a sphere a and the hemisphere b so the hemisphere is coming from the lower part of the soccer player here okay and obviously the sphere is representing the ball so it's sphere a and the hemisphere b okay uh, which are in contact with one another part a complete the plan of both solids in contact so what we have to do is they've given us the sphere b in elevation and plan they've given us sphere a in elevation but we have to find sphere a in the plan view so that's part a we have to get sphere a in the plan so sphere a they already give us the radius so technically the center point of sphere a in elevation is here so the center point has to be somewhere down along that line as well now how are we going to get that all we're going to do is we're going to bring spear A into a position when it's actually um, looking at it here. It's touching. And is it in front of it, actually? Yeah, sorry. It's actually directly in front of it. And all we're going to do is we're going to take the radius of spear A and add it onto sphere or hemisphere B. So I'm going to extend out a line there from hemisphere B in the plan view. I'm going to take the radius from sphere A. Take that radius there from sphere A, and I'm going to extend it out from hemisphere B. Now, that technically would be the position of sphere A, okay, the ball, when it is kind of touching and they're literally side by side. But we can see here from the elevation, it's they're not side by side, it's slightly in front of it. So it's actually somewhere down here. And that's what we have to do. We have to locate that. Okay, so... We have found the position of it, as I said, when they're side by side. Now, if they're always in contact with one another, it's like, imagine this is the player, okay, and it's kicking the ball. Technically, if they're always in contact with one another, they're also in contact here when they're side by side, I would simply rotate the center around. Okay, and I've now rotated the center of sphere A around until it's in its correct position. Now, at that point there, that is the position of sphere A when it's in its correct position. And more importantly, we've also found the point of contact. And all I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw in that sphere. I'll come back at the end of the question and heavy in the important details. So there we have it, taking the radius again, pop it in here. Might be a bit hard to see that at the moment, but I'll have it in a while. So there we have um, sphere A in the plan view. So that's the first part of the question. Draw the, uh, complete the plan of both solids in contact. We've done that, and more importantly, I've also located technically the points of contact. Now, they haven't asked us for it, but I would always put it in. 
that point right there would be the plan view of the point of contact in the plan, where sphere A and sphere B touch one another. Now I want to find the elevation. Now the elevation, because the two of them actually have the same, or the exact same size, that would be the elevation of it. Okay, of my point of contact. Okay, that's part A done. Part B, draw the plan of another sphere. So it tells us to draw the plan of another sphere of diameter 20 millimeters, okay, um, which rests on the horizontal plane in position C so that it is in contact with sphere A and sphere B. So first of all, its diameter is 20 millimeters, but its radius, another sphere, its radius will be 10 millimeters, okay? So it's slightly smaller than these guys here, A and B. So what we have to do is we have to find a common point between both sphere A and hemisphere B where there's going to be another sphere, in this case C, that touches both sphere A and hemisphere B as well. So first of all, to give you a bit of information, it rests on the horizontal plane, so it's actually touching the XY line in elevation. Its diameter is 20 millimeters, and we've already determined if the diameter is 20, the radius is 10. So from the XY line, I'm going to measure up 10 millimeters. So from 11 up as far as 12. Mark that up there. Just do a horizontal line across. So technically, in elevation, somewhere along that line there should be um, our, uh, our sphere, uh, should, sorry, the center point for our sphere C, okay? Should be at that height. Now, in the plan view, what we have to do is we have to determine uh, where that is going to be. But I need to do it in my elevation first to find it. So all we're going to do then is I'm going to focus on sphere A first of all. From sphere A, technically, if I had a sphere that had a radius of 10 millimeters touching that, and imagine it was touching it at height and it was floating in midair, well then the center point would simply be 10 millimeters away from here. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to mark out 10 millimeters. Now that there is the position right there of a ghost sphere, sphere C, when it is touching sphere A. But the problem is, it's actually not touching it from the ground. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rotate that around until it is actually going to be on the ground. So I take the center from sphere A, I'm going to rotate it down until it is at the same height. And right there now, that there is the center point for a sphere C uh, when it is in contact with sphere A. Now, I've got the center point in elevation. I now have to find the center point in my plan. So, the center point of sphere A in plan is here. Now, bring this down. Okay, and you can see that point right there. Now, all I'm going to do with that is I'm going to rotate that all the way around. Take that distance. I'm going to rotate that. until it's inside here somewhere. Now, what have we done there? We've essentially imagined that there was a sphere C touching sphere A up at this height, first of all. We rotate it down until it's now touching, technically, the horizontal plane as well, and that is the position for sphere C. That's it when it's touching the outside of sphere A in this position. We want to get it until it's over here. So all we did was we rotated sphere C until it's in its correct position over here. How do I find the exact position? Well, we have to do then, or to, sorry, we have to repeat the process then with hemisphere B. So from hemisphere B, I'm going to do a line out. I'm going to measure on that line the exact same as we did here, 10 millimeters. And after I measure that 10 millimeters, I'm going to rotate it from sphere B. From there. So the exact same thing as we did here. I've now found the position of sphere C when it's in contact with sphere B and the horizontal plane. That's the center point of it. Bring it down. And outside of sphere B, that is the center point when it's just touching sphere B. And once again, I'm going to rotate it. And where the two arcs cross each other should be a common point. That point right in there where the two arcs cross each other is a point where we have a sphere C of radius or diameter 20, radius 10, 
that is in contact with both hemisphere B and sphere A. Okay, now I'm going to draw it in. This is small. So I'm going to take 10 millimeters, which I've already measured on my sheet here. I'm going to move this back a little bit. Taking the distance from there to there. I'm going to draw it in as best I can. It might overlap a tiny bit, and that's okay. So it is sitting underneath it. It's perfect. A little bit of inaccuracy there. So I've got the plan view of the sphere. Now I have to find the elevation. So bring up the center because I found the exact position of it in plan. So here is the exact position in elevation. Okay, and once again, take this, okay, draw it in, right, that's it in elevation, I'm just going to switch it out now to my marker, things will become a little bit clearer, I'll do it as neatly as I possibly can. Right, so first of all, I'm going to focus on sphere A. There is sphere A in plan. Now I'm going to focus on sphere C. This is a really small one here. I'll see it until it goes to the outside edge of both hemisphere B and sphere A. And then when it goes inside it, this is where the marker does help. Just makes it a little bit easier for us. Now, based on my accuracy there, there probably should be a little bit more inside there. All right, now I've drawn it in elevation, or plan. I'm going to draw it in elevation. Now, technically, sphere C is in front of sphere B, so I probably should have hidden detail in there, but they've already heavy it in beforehand, so nothing I can do about that. So I'll heavy this section in. And inside there, once again, it's like I have hidden detail. there we go okay there you have it, folks um draw the plan of another sphere of diameter 20 which says and so it is in contact with sphere a and hemisphere um, b so there you have it, folks uh, that was a nice little solids in contact question something that would actually be very similar to what was on the old junior cycle uh, technical graphic syllabus so i'll just zoom out there bring this back into focus um, so there's the four questions there, guys, from the 2011 DCG Higher Level Section A paper. This question here, based on the principle of a tetrahedron with a sphere inside it. Uh, we had the conics question here, based on an ellipse with a tangent. We had the skew lines question here, based on the shortest horizontal distance. And we had a solids and contact question here. Okay, as always, guys, I hope you found that helpful. That is the video done.